It's a great honor to address you today, our guest. I have to say our special guest is Mrs. Natasha Lecky, Minister of State for External Affairs and Culture in the Indian Government. She's going to have a short lecture and answer about judicial system in India and answer on your questions. Before that, our colleague Gunnar Bivets will tell us some most important points from the curriculum week. Thank you. So, on behalf of the University of Belgrade Faculty of Law, I'm honored to welcome and introduce Mrs. Mitakashi Lekhi, Minister of State for External Affairs and Cultural Republic of India. Mrs. Lekhi assumed charge of this position in July 2021, and she has an impressive legal and political background. Mrs. Lekhi graduated in Bachelor of Science from Hindi College and Bachelor of Law from Campus Law Center of Delhi University and enrolled with the Bar Council of Delhi in 1990. She has a vast courtroom experience, including several tribunals, Delhi High Court and the Supreme Court, with particular focus on indirect taxes and criminal law. She also practiced in a range of forums across India and handled numerous issues pertaining to women in courts, such as domestic violence, family law disputes, and most importantly, the issue of permanent commission of the lady officers in the armed forces. As for her political career, Mrs. Lekhi has been elected twice into the Lok Sabha, the lower house of the Indian parliament, from the Bharatiya Janata Party, first in 2014 and then in 2019. During her parliamentary tenure, she has been a member of numerous parliamentary committees, such as House Committee, Press Council of India, Standing Committees on External Affairs and Urban Development, Consultative Committee of Ministry of Defence, Joint Committee on Offices of Profit, Committee of Chairpersons, and General Purposes Committee. She has also served as the Chairperson of the Committee of Privileges, Committee on Public Undertakings, and Joint Committee on the Personal Data Protection Bill of 2019. Last but not least, Mrs. Lecky has been a prominent social activist and has been actively associated with institutions and organizations working towards protection of the rights of women and children in the country. She held the post of National Vice President of Bharatiya Janata Party Mahila Mocha in 2010. She has also been a part of drafting committees for the Women's Reservation Bill and Sexual Harassment of Women and Workplace Bill, among others. Mrs. Lecky, now I give the floor to you and later we'll have time for a brief discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess lawyers talk better when they stand. Um, uh, something happens, so uh, uh, the dean, uh, Mr. Mehuri, uh members of the faculty, and my dear students, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to interact with all the young minds across the globe, and especially the ones which are not uh, part of my country, but uh, definitely will impact the future relationships between the country. And uh, in any case, uh, the lawmakers, especially with the process of globalization, we have uh, all common law systems in which we work together. So to have a greater understanding, uh, especially amongst lawyers and political thinkers, is uh, very, very important. So from our own experience of uh, constitutional democracy, uh, let me just brief up that uh, there is no system which is perfect, but it's the legal minds which try and keep improving it every time. And uh, the Constitution of India was devised, I think the lawmakers of that time were so clever that they gave the Constitution a firmness to work with, and yet mobility and elasticity to maneuver the changes which the future generations may face with. And that is the beauty of the Indian constitution. It's one of the longest documents, but so be it. Being the longest, it is also worth the length it has because it actually defines the laws for virtually 
all spheres of life. The second aspect, which according to me, being a lawyer and a politician, uh, is that the, the independence of judiciary, which is uh, enshrined within the Constitution, is one of the most important aspects of our Constitution. So to be a judge, your political opinion is immaterial. What matters is a certain years of experience as a lawyer and knowledge of law. With these two things, one can qualify to be a judge. You don't have to be linked to a political party. You don't have to be linked to a politician to become a judge. On the contrary, if you are linked, it may actually be counterproductive for your judicial career. So that is the kind of strength which our judiciary possesses. And uh, the, the method of hierarchy, as we all understand, the method of hierarchy of legal system is basically pyramidical. So we have uh, some mufasil courts, magisterial courts, and above the magistrates, we will have sessions and civil judges to deal with civil matters, sometimes commercial courts to deal with commercial matters. And uh, then we have uh, the high courts, which are of various states. And there is only one Supreme Court. There are not Supreme Courts of states, which is unlike the uh, system of very many federal governments where each state will have its own Supreme Court. In India, the Supreme Court is just one, which is like the highest most court, but available to the lowest most people in the hierarchy in the pecking order. So any individual, if has an issue of fundamental rights, because those rights are also defined uh, within the Constitution and have been elaborated upon and dwelt on by various judgments over a long period of time. And through those judgments, we are able to define what makes a fundamental right. For example, right to life and liberty, right to procedural equality, right against discrimination, right to freedom of choice, freedom of religion, freedom against exploitation. Now, these are fundamental rights which every individual is supposed to possess. Based on these fundamental rights, anyone with no money, no backup, nothing, can simply write a postcard and say, I am being exploited and my fundamental right to life is getting violated. The court can take cognizance. That is the strength of the system. And the strength of the system is like we all come from formal backgrounds of law. So formal background, someone has to be a petitioner or a complainant, a plaint has to be signed, a stamp duty needs to be paid, and only then can you access judicial system. That's the normal process. But in case of some severe cases of violation of human rights or uh, personal rights or fun fundamental rights, one need not get into that formality. A line or two lines are good enough to access judicial system and judicial intervention. And it has happened not once, twice. Of course, the discretion is the discretion of the judge, but the system allows that discretion. That is the beauty of the constitutional mechanism, that, that constitutional mechanism provides for that discretion. And because of that discretion, people are able to access judicial system. That is one aspect. The second aspect is we have a system, and this particular letter or a word or um, a news clipping will act as public interest litigation, PIL. So in the interest of public, a judicial intervention is needed, and judiciary can simply intervene, which gives judiciary a great strength to deal with the wrongs which may be happening in the social system or in the governance structure. So to make governance more accountable and answerable, this is one technique which the courts usually can depend on and people also of a, a cit Indian citizenry can depend on. The other aspect is sewer motor cognizance. 
The sewer motor cognizance is caught with court of its own accord. Of its own. Nobody has to file, nobody has to tell, nobody has to say anything. Court on its own accord can pick up any matter. So recently, when COVID-19 situation was very bad in the second wave, and uh, we are a very, very large country, so uh, and with quasi-federal structure, so center has some responsibilities, and so do the state governments have their responsibilities. Not every state government is run by the same political party. And anyone who's a, um, who's a political scientist, most all lawyers are. Uh, so if you understand the politics, in politics, there's always the politics of opposition also. No matter how good the government's working, there will be some voices which will continue to bring you down, not act in accordance with law, or not, not uh, assuage to the problems which people are faced with, sometimes sheer inefficiency of the system, and um, which, is, which is going to pull others down. So court of its own accord picked up COVID-19 matter. And there was a huge, huge criticism of the court also for that, that you're intervening into the executive powers, you're intervening into the political powers, but no matter how much you criticize, the power of the court is power of the court, and no political party can actually criticize the court enough for court to take its decision back. That is the strength of the judicial system. The, all the strength comes because within the system, there are inbuilt mechanisms of checks and balances for every process there is a check and there is a counterbalance. The biggest counterbalance is that every democracy needs to run by the rule of law. And that rule of law can be established like we have a written constitution. Then there has to be some authority which is going to check, which has to be in independent of political interventions. So there are three limbs to government. It's part of the government. So first is legislature, which people like us who get elected and get into the process of lawmaking. The second limb is executive, which is a bureaucratic service. And the bureaucratic service like our ambassador, my DS, other people in the embassy, they've all come through the bureaucratic service where you have to write an exam to qualify, and that makes a permanent structure of governance. So while politicians get elected to rule, the, the bureaucracy stays there forever, and there are different services which get to be governed and controlled by a very, very stable bureaucracy. And third is judiciary. Why is judiciary so important in democracy? if processes are going to be run through legal systems, then those processes have to be controlled by the legal systems. And who establishes the law? The legislature establishes the law. But legislature can become a law unto themselves. Simply because you enjoy the popular voice, you enjoy people's voice because we get elected. So the, the understanding is, that uh, people are with me. So if people are with me, people can say, okay, we will only allow people to wear white shirt. Anybody with a different color of shirt, we will not allow because they don't like any other color. Can that become a law? No, it cannot certainly become a law. But if a legislature is foolish enough to make that a law, the judiciary is sitting there to correct that law because the constitutional framework gives every individual freedom of choice. So you have a choice to wear red, blue, black, green, unless it's part of uniform, and for a special purpose, you have to dress in a certain way. But individuals' choices need to be respected. And for respecting those individual choices, if legislature becomes a law unto themselves, the corrective process has to come from judiciary, and that is the power of independent judiciary that it can strike down that law. Because 
This law is not in confirmation with the principles established by constitutional mandate. And that constitutional mandate is the freedom of choice and freedom of life. And that is how important the independence of judiciary is. And the independence of judiciary, I'm borrowing some words from James Madison, who's the constitutional maker of the United States. And he said, in our democracy, the law, the constitution, and the judiciary, basically judiciary is the most effective defensive armor. So it's an armor, and it's a defensive armor. And defensive armor to protect the constitution, the people, the country, the legislation, and the law. And that is the duty of judiciary, basically. Now imagine if judiciary, for some reason, is not allowed to do this job, or is not allowed to, or the basic function of judiciary is taken away by the process of political intervention or um, any such rogue mechanism, what will be the result? The result will be a chaotic society because ultimately all of us are bound by the law and that is what democracies are all about. It is why the uh, government of the people, by the people, for the people, but how? How is that government supposed to function? What is it supposed to do? What each one's job responsibility and duty is? What each one's rights are? Now to see to it that those rights and duties form a balance in the society and take the country forward, we definitely need a very, very strong judiciary. And to have a strong judiciary, the judicial mechanisms have to be such that they act as a police onto the police. They are policing the police. They are policing the government. They are making sure that they themselves remain bound by the law, their jurisdictions, and yet see to it that everybody else, every other organelle of the government is bound by the law. So nobody is supreme. What is supreme is the law. In fact, I have another quotation to make from our ancient system. The ancient system in India was that the king was supreme. But the king was not a monarch. The king was an elected person, more like a head of state in today's democratic uh, methodology. But was, the word used was Rajan or the king. And the king, at the time of taking the crown or taking the chair or the seat, would go forward and uh, before that he had to take permission from the priest. And the priest will hit the king on his head with a small baton and recite in Sanskrit. The king will say, I am supreme. He will get a stick from the uh, priest saying, you not supreme, the law is supreme. Say, law is supreme. So the king will say, okay, I bow before the supremacy of law. And that will be repeated five times before he could actually take the chair. So uh, the king is made to understand that why you've been elected by the people, that you're not supreme. You may be supreme for uh, everyone else, but law is supreme and even you have to buy before the law. That is the rule. And that is the rule of law which we all follow today. That no president, no prime minister, no parliament, nobody is supreme. The supremacy of law is what makes these people supreme. And it's not individual power. It is the collective power of the people which throws these people up into those positions. And while these people are in those positions, they get to be governed by the law. So you can do no wrong because you yourself are bound by the law. Now, our minister will, may look supreme decision maker in the hierarchy of things, 
But is the minister supreme in the decision-making process? Answer is no. There is a hierarchy. That hierarchy is defined. That hierarchy will move a file in a certain way. The opinions will come forward. And even a minister is bound by the writings and is also bound by the subordinate legislation. There is a notification which is going to which is going to de define and determine who's going to take a call, how much. So while you are there as a decision-making person, but you're not supreme. It's the collective input. And that collective input is defined by the legal mechanisms. And those legal mechanisms in turn get to be governed by the constitutional framework. And that constitutional framework needs to be implemented. No matter how good the laws are, no matter how good the regulations are, no matter how good the licensing policy is, ultimately, all that needs to be implemented. Who implements that? Executive. But while implementing, are they always right? Are they always fair? Are they always following the principle of equity? Answer is no. There could be disputes. There could be problems. There could be problems of understanding one's jurisdiction. There could be problems in execution process. There could be problems in person's perception, ideology. Now, whenever those problems arise, who's going to be the arbiter? The arbiter is going to be judiciary. To see to it that the will of the people as exhibited in the constitution, which is a written document, gets to be implemented. And if that doesn't get implemented, all that is going to be ensured by the judicial process, the judges, and those judges have the power to see to it that things get done as per the constitutional mandate. If laws are written contrary to the constitutional mandate, they can be struck down and called ultra-virus. And it can simply be declared ultra-virus, the constitution, throw them out, no parliament, can implement that law, one. Second, if in execution and implementation of law there is a problem, that execution and implementation will be again dealt by the court. And the court can definitely pick that up and say, this got to be done. Otherwise, we will take you to task. And thus the courts, especially the High Court and the Supreme Court, and even Trial Court, they all have the power which is a punitive power, to see to it that their judgments get implemented. And those judgments get implemented through a process. They can summon any, any administrative body, any judicial body, anybody else, uh, which is in hierarchy below them, and see to it that the implementation process takes place. Now, in the absence of implementation, there is a special power which the courts exercise. That is called contempt of court. Now, if the processes are not getting implemented, the contempt of court will come into existence and start rolling down. And that contempt will see to it that they can punish people who are eroding the process of legislative mechanism or judicial services or uh, judicial or access to judicial system by people and then take that forward and that power of contempt of court is a, another supreme power which the judiciary possesses. The judiciary also has a power which is in the form of review. So how the generation of law happens is of course the written law in the form of a, a, a legal document, act, enactment, legislation. And legislation can also have uh, implication in terms of notification, subordinate legislation, various formats. And those formats is one aspect of legal process. The other aspect of legal process is precedence. So there, as I said, no matter how good the laws are, they finally have to be implemented. And there are going to be conflicts in understanding and implementation process. The courts decide what does that law mean. So many a times the interpretation of courts could be include, when I say humans or when we say men, 
men would mean women also. That's the cause discretion and in that discretion men mean women and that principle of equality applies to all. That is one interpretation. Now with this interpretation the literal meaning of men has changed, right? It's applying to humans, it's applying to individuals and at times when we talk about rights, uh, the rights have to be, the fundamental rights, for example, applied to human beings. Initially, the word written was men. We got women uh, through improvisation process and legal interpretation, and it applies to all human beings. Now, some uh, animal lover goes to the court and says the laws and rights apply to the dogs also. They also have a right to live and other animals also have a right to a safe environment and against cruelty even they have a right. Now technically fundamental rights are rights of humans, okay? How do you get animals incorporated into those rights? So you need a legal mind to interpret it in a way that this is as much part of humanity to act against cruelty to animals, right? So the legal interpretation would now include the rights of animals against cruelty, which is technically from the very beginning, a law which was meant for men, you get women included to legal interpretation, then you get animals included as a right against cruelty, also become part of your legislative thinking and law. So one is the legislation, the second is precedence, and third is tradition. Now all these three things combined together make the codified law. And that codification of law is what becomes the body of law. And that body of law has to be implemented by various processes in the judicial system. And in this process of judicial system, the bottommost court, so Mufasil court, the magisterial court, will see to what the body of law on a particular subject says and is flowing from high court. The high court itself is bound by the law passed by the Supreme Court. But in case Supreme Court wants to change its opinion, so that power of review lies with the Supreme Court to change its opinion that at a certain point the thinking was in a certain way and that thinking over a period of time has changed and evolved and today this thinking means this, the power of review rests with the Supreme Court. That is the power of review. Now being a large country as we are, the arbitral, so one is the arbitrariness of processes, something which is completely looked down upon. But the power to arbitrate between various states. Now, there could be water disputes between different states, sharing of water, sharing of natural resources, migration between the states, the welfare mechanisms between the states. Who's going to decide? Well, we are one country, but in a federal structure, each federal state has its own rights of governance, methodologies of governance. If there's a conflict between the states, how does that work? So the conflict between the states will be addressed by the Supreme Court. Just because the Supreme Lawmaking Body, or I shouldn't say lawmaking body, but it's a law implementing body, and dispute resolution mechanism is the Supreme Body. Between the states, the resolution of states could be done by the Supreme Court. Then power of the Supreme Court, there could be some writing has happened. Who's at fault? The police says, I was hit by the people. I was hit because there was a stone pelting incident and we were pelted with stones. Or some people were engaging in arsenal and causing mayhem to innocent people on the street. Whereas those people will say no police indulged in excesses and they didn't do the right thing. Those kinds of things happen in, as part of governance. So commission of inquiry is something which happens when there's a dispute between 
say, uh, administrator and the people and the rights of two sides need to be determined. So commission of inquiry, the government of the day will issue a notification. A judge or a body of judges, few judges, will work together and a commission of inquiry will be formulated by them. And that is also a power of the court. And that is where even the judiciary come forward to uh, run, the gov uh, run the country better and be part of the governance structure. Whether this was the fault of uh, an executive or it was fault of the people or there were miscreants who were behind all this, those kinds of situations, or go deep into it, that there was a funding from external forces, some disruptive elements are getting funded through some agencies. So you bring your evidence uh, up, uh, and, and, and the court will become the arbiter and the investigative tool of the government to determine who's wrong, who's at fault, and who's doing the right thing. When it comes to power of governance, the judiciary can also have a reference mechanism. For example, a citizenship amendment, whether a foreigner can become the prime minister of the country um, in the absence of reciprocity. Now, a question like this arises, or what constitutes a fundamental right and uh, uh, having absence of reciprocal arrangements. Uh, the government of the day wants to reduce litigation and wants a quick fix to this problem which has suddenly erupted and cropped. And when this sudden problem has erupted and cropped, how will the government handle it? There could be, you know, uh, issue with governance itself because you need a prime minister, you need someone to run the government, you need to handle things well, but this particular person may be propped up because of uh, the, the manner of governance or the political structure itself. Uh, what will the government do? The head of the state which is president in our case, or even an existing prime minister or, or a government, whatever problem they are not finding an answer to can refer the matter to the Supreme Court. And they can say, okay, you take a call. Is this legally right? Is this legally wrong? Does the constitution allow? Is this annihilation of citizenship right? How do we go about it? What is what is what is what does the law say? What is how the international law domestic law, the constitutional system operate, give us an opinion. Now the beauty is the court can refuse to intervene at times. Court can say, sorry, you handle it. We, have, we don't want to handle a political situation, not our job. The second thing is the court can come up with an opinion and court can definitely pass an order. And when the court gives an opinion and passes an order, the government of the day need not follow that order. So independence on both sides. One, independence to refer the matter. Two, independence not to intervene in the matter. Three, even when a decision has come, the government is not bound by that. It's optional. So as long as it is not unconstitutional, then if you do something which is unconstitutional of its own cognizance, the Supreme Court can strike it down and say, this is ultra-virus the system, and thus we will not allow this law to be made. So in the appointment of judges, the politicians have no role. We are more or less like a post office, signing authorities. We have some interventions to the extent the administration will send some kind of reports on individuals where they can say so and so is politically linked or is uh, harboring some ill will or is corrupt or any of those things, then of course government has a right to strike those names out on those issues. But other than that, government is not participatory body in the appointment of judges. So it's a system which takes care of itself. And the best is government pays for all this. So the funding finance as a corpus mechanism goes through the central funds or the state funds in case of law judiciary. But the control on those funds or the distribution of those funds is not with the government. It's for the judiciary. So judiciary becomes an administrator also. 
So the judicial administration is completely independent of the other administration. There's no IAS, Indian Administrative Service Officer, who's going to control who gets paid and who doesn't get paid. It's a judicial officer doing that job. And that is what determines the independence of judiciary. So appointment, finance, while the Government of India will fund that body, but Government of India will have no say on how the money gets to be spent. The entire financial administrative control remains with the judiciary itself, which acts like an independent limb of the government. Uh, when it comes to issues like, um, so, so this is by and large what, what the judicial system does, but I will also, uh, I'm sure everyone here sitting in this audience is aware that uh, the main function of the judiciary is to dispense justice. And dispense justice to who? People who are aggrieved. And people who are aggrieved, that dispensation of justice needs to happen how? Through rule of law. Now there could be civil disputes, child custody cases, guardianship, somebody has died, his estate, her estate needs to be taken care of, estate, interstate rights, execution of will, execution of trust, the trust deeds need to be made, seeing to it that all this is done in a just manner. Those are regular features of any judicial system. Even in monarchical system, this is the job of the judges and, and judges do all this. Criminal cases, somebody has assaulted someone, raped someone, molested someone, uh, murdered some people. So those are criminal offenses for which you need a judge to decide the quantum of punishment or even the guiltiness, whether someone's guilty or not guilty, also needs to be adjudicated upon. So personal disputes and criminal offenses. As per the rule of that particular country, penal court and the civil court will decide the regulation and the judges will implement that um, uh, uh, those punishments or the, uh, implement the, the, the document itself in terms of the law of the land. But the, the main function of judiciary in a democratic setup especially is to work like a watchdog, to work like a hawk, that the processes of governance are accountable, transparent, free of corruption, and the law as determined by the forefathers of the country are followed to fulfill that dream of independence. And that is what makes judiciary so important in a democratic country. Because judiciary becomes the soul of the people and that sole job is to protect the soul of the nation and allow no tarnish to come to it. And that can only happen once structurally we construct a judiciary which is independent from those phrase and above corruption, above the issues of governance and see to it that good governance is the rule. And good governance requires a completely independent, strong-willed judges who are not going to cow down to the political masters or the executives of the day and stay independent and stay true to their job. And that is where I feel the strength of Indian system is being able to throw a very, very strong judiciary, which has the powers will be it, but that doesn't mean there is a judicial tyranny, tyranny at work, because there could be a legal tyranny at work when it comes to, say, legislature or executive, but there could be judicial tyranny as well. So judiciary doesn't act with tyranny. There are methods to deal with corrupt judges also. And those methods are impeachment proceedings which can happen in the parliament if judges are found to be untrue to the constitution they are supposed to propagate. And that power to decide 
or to deal with corruption in judiciary rests with the parliament house other than that the judiciary is kept free from all encumbrances a judicial persons act cannot even be discussed in the parliament also and the the floor of the house you can criticize the judgment but not the judge so there is a kind of a seal mechanism uh, in which is which is inviolate uh, legally that that protection is assured to the judges that they cannot be criticized and they their but democracy also means criticism so you can criticize the judgment but not necessarily the judge you can say this thinking is flawed for this 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 reason but not necessarily that person is corrupt for writing this there's a difference and if the person is corrupt then impeachment is what the parliament will take up that is the kind of assurance within the legal system that helps the judiciary to stay on path and judiciary sees to it that all other limbs stay on path and most important cases in our uh, legal fray have mostly been the cases where no court fee has been paid those are public interest litigation the rights of women the rights of deprived classes um, so sometimes politicians do get into this problem of hyper judicial activism uh, which we all kind of tend to look down upon but ultimately all this balances is out and it's all for the good of the country a bit of a tension between judiciary legislature and executive i think is necessary for the welding of the system and independence of the system with these words thank you very much jai hind Did I exceed my time? I was not keeping a watch. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. Also, no, it happens when you're in a flow, you know, you kind of... Also, online participants are free to ask the questions in the chat box and I'll read it out loud. Well, there is one question. Well, first of all, thank you for coming here. Uh, I would like to ask a question. A lot of countries here in Europe that are relatively smaller, but their courts, supreme or constitutional, are complaining about being overwhelmed with tax tasks. So how come? How does the supreme Indian court in such a big country manages to achieve all of these tasks and still stay uh, with a good reputation? I'm sorry, I didn't catch it properly. Could you please repeat the question? Uh -huh. uh, so I've noticed that a lot of European countries, their courts, the supreme ones, are complaining about being overwhelmed with the tasks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And how does the a big state of India manage to do that? Uh, so, sorry, if I um, so we also have problems, and managing the task is always a challenge, and uh, uh, the it does definitely causes delays and uh, rights do get impacted impaired and to begin with i only i said no system is perfect system so there are issues within every system and being overwhelmed uh, by the sheer uh, number of cases the number of complaints which have to be handled i guess the governments need to invest more and population is to ju judges uh, ratio needs to improve everywhere everywhere and and that should be the strength and but even the richest of the rich countries are not perfect when it comes to legal systems the delays may be less but then there are faults within the system of a different nature so 
I, I guess that's the job of democracy to see to it that more investment is made into judicial system for the well-being of uh, society because disputes need to be resolved quickly and as early as possible. Anyone else? So, yeah, please. There's a gentleman at the back. Well, first, we came to the lecture. I want to ask uh, are there any courts of special jurisdiction in India, something like an administrative court? Could you please take the mask off, please? Well, I want to ask uh, are there any courts of special jurisdiction in India? Yes, there are many courts of special jurisdictions. So we will primarily have a civil court, criminal court, commercial court. But they, within this stream, there could be uh, something called uh, uh, economic offenses court, which will deal with, uh, say, tax evasion, etc. There could be tax courts, which are specializing in tax matters only. There could be guardianship and uh, uh, minors court which is dealing with guardianship matters. There could be matrimonial courts, which are dealing with matrimonial disputes. So within this range, like broad range of civil and criminal, there could be thousand different types. There could be CBI courts, which is a special court, which is a very, very tough court dealing with uh, cases of corruption. And CBI is a agency which deals with um, uh, corruption in uh, government and governance and very high profile matters are dealt with by CBI court. So enforcement directorate and FERA courts, which is dealing with external tax evasion, say import duties or sending the money out of the country and all that. So they, they go to special court. So there's a multiplicity of courts within the broad parameter of civil criminal and if you really want to divide it, you could make it into commercial and tax matters. And of course, appellate courts. Now, from the, the very, very basic court, uh, depending on the nature of offense or the amount of money involved, from the basic trial court, the matter has to go in appeal. And that appellate court, there could be one appeal, depending on, again, the nature of amount in case of civil court or uh, nature of punishment in case of punitive court. There are appellate courts, which is usually a session judge, a high court, and a supreme court. These are first appeal, second appeal in most cases, but there could be third appeal also. So these are, um, this is how the hierarchical system is set up within the, within the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.